me start by saying how excited I am to share with you and connect with you today. Now, I've worked within the advertising and marketing industry for over 10 years as a creative strategist and creative communicator tasked with helping brands connect more authentically with their customers, launching new products, new brand campaigns, and enhancing brand images. Now, part of my role as a strategist is being able to help brands solve pressing business problems with creative communication. You can say that, you know, words are my art form. But if you sat in a boardroom, you're confronted with very expensive words, uh, many acronyms, um, which can be a challenge in terms of really finding creative solutions through communication. Reality is that great leaders know that the level of their effectiveness is in direct relationship with their ability to be effective. Over the course of my career, I've been fascinated with how much bad advertising communication uh, makes its way to us, uh, particularly on our social feeds. And when we look at the impact of poor advertising and the relationship between brand and consumer, it can lead to feelings of mistrust and dissatisfaction. Now, if you think about any close relationship that you do have, uh, this could be a family, uh, could be a friend, or even a romantic relationship uh, with your partner. When communication breaks down, it leads to the sense of conflict, uh, growing resentments, discontent, and even a loss of trust. We observe uh, the same phenomenon in brand consumer relationships. Uh, the more bad communication messaging that goes out, uh, the more apathy is experienced. According to the Edelman Trust Barometer, South Africans trust in public institutions and organizations sits at just 14%, which is one of the lowest in the world. Um, this is a great challenge, but also a great opportunity, uh, particularly if you're within kind of communication fraternity. Before we even begin to understand how to solve this problem, it's important that we have a view of this communication framework, the way in which messages are communicated and received and how culture plays a role in determining great advertising from really bad advertising uh, and mitigating this decline in trust. About four or five years ago, a study was published that was aimed at understanding the sphere of influence between brands, fans, celebrities, uh, and even everyday people. It's called the culture of proximity, a term used to describe how far or close we are from one another. The culture of proximity is this notion that culture exists uh, in multiple categories that influence and intersect uh, with each other. They discovered in the study that the differences between brands and fans and celebrities and even content creators has blurred and become entangled. This is due in part to, to the rise of the internet, uh, most notably social media. Now, historically, we've all lived within a close culture. This is the culture that we create with people around us, consisting of friends, families, um, and even our neighbors. Um, so basically, you have a bunch of small communities, each with their own cultural norms and customs, but these communities were slightly isolated from each other. The only way that these communities could get information uh, was through mainstream media known as the mass culture. And we all participated within this mass culture. Uh, this is what celebrities are saying, the newspapers, television, radio, politics are all communicating. And we can all hear this stuff. Um, and we can see this stuff as well. But we didn't participate in an interactive way. It was a one-way concept that dictated uh, our worldview, determining what is cool, what is not cool, what is important or not important, uh, what is the valuable physical appearance in the world, um, what is valued and not valued, the images of confidence, beauty, intelligence, um, and even what products uh, we should buy. And traditionally, it was curated to the dominant views of the time. Then came the internet uh, and gave close cultures uh, an opportunity to connect with each other, giving rise to this crowd culture, which has become the national discourse. And we see this reflected in the public's um, feelings around, for example, you know, COVID-19, uh, load shedding, corruption, celebrity gossip gender-based violence, human rights, etc. The crowd culture has now thus grown in influence as social media has evolved. And the people who run the mass culture can now hear this. What has started to occur is that the crowd culture helps to inform and regulate the mass culture, creating this entanglement and interactive conversation. What we're seeing now with brands uh, are beginning to engage in dialogue with potential customers. You know, Nike, choosing to stand with the likes of Colin Kaepernick, taking the advocacy of more progressive ideals of pride, passion, equality against violence committed against black lives in America, 
our own Nando's even taking the opportunity to use political satire as a way to connect with South Africans in a more authentic way. Dove beginning to reimagine beauty standards. Brands like Converse providing bursaries to students um, experiencing issues with student debt. We see some brands taking on a more progressive and more purposeful role to connect with people in a more authentic way that actually fosters connection. Cultural relevance plays a significant role in bridging deficits in brand communication. You know, according to Twitter, it makes up 25% of purchasing decisions alone. Price, quality, and brand reputation is no longer enough to sustain a customer relationship. When looking at the South African landscape, we see brands collaborating with local creatives as a way to connect, aligning themselves with cultural events, passions, trends, um, and even shifting to respond to immediate points of interest that's happening within the public discourse. Examples of this include, you know, visual artists like Karabo Popi um, having collaborated with the likes of Nike, Russell Abrams collaborating with the likes of Adidas and H&M, fashion designers like Richie Nisi, Wanda Lefoto, photographers like Austin Malema uh, and Hanim Christians. These are the custodians of crowd culture, the custodians of our creative expression, whose work exists solely to connect with people. Creativity is inherent to culture. If culture is the background, the creativity is the object of our fascination uh, and is likely to become the new background over time for emerging and forthcoming creativity. At the essence of any effective communication is this idea of influence. How do we move people uh, to action or thought or even reflection? Influence can now come from anywhere or anything, forcing those who used to own the mass culture, the likes of celebrities, politicians, brands, to stop, take note, uh, and change their perspective. It's important to understand that we live in a hyper-globalized world. For brands, it's important to know that people's opinions uh, aren't just shaped by competitor advertising, it's shaped by everything. The biggest barrier for brands when connecting with people is, is culture, forming communication that's anchored in understanding of our hopes, our fears, and even our motivations. The challenge for brands is to bring creativity of the crowd culture into the boardroom. In summary, I think the most important takeouts here are, you know, the fact that creativity is an essential part of creating effective communication. Culture is an evolving so quickly that culture is evolving so quickly, um, we need to develop a cultural intelligence to, to navigate.